space. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, Peter Burgess, who is the uh, Peter, Professor Peter Burgess is from the Peace Research Institute of Oslo, and uh, Peter is coordinating the ETIS project, uh, but he's also the uh, probably the most senior person on ethics and security in Europe, and, and his words are very welcome to us in any circumstance. So Peter will, will take over the chairing of the forum from now. So Peter. <coughs> Thank you, sir. Let me then also add my words of welcome to Slabs, and uh, in particular uh, tell you that it should be underscored because we're in the, in the offices of the European Parliament, <coughs> for which we're very grateful, that this is a, a European uh, Commission funded project from the seventh, one of the last of the seventh uh, term pro uh, program in the security research uh, program. It's a three year project. At this. Uh, and it has a con consists of a consortium of 10 members, very diverse, uh, with a large uh, diversity of functions, and as it's good to have in any European integration project a diversity of uh, a geographical uh, diversity. In addition to my own institute, Creo, in, in Oslo, there's the Swedish Defense Research Agency, the Hague Center for Strategic Studies, Trilateral Research and Consulting in London, uh, Fraunhofer, ISI and IST in uh, Germany, of course, the Center for Irish and European uh, uh, Security, represented by Simon McCarthy here in Dublin, the Austrian Institute of Technology, Safra Morfo in France, uh, Morgan David Adom in Israel, and not least the police service of Northern Ireland. So we're very, very grateful on behalf of this entire consortium for the hospitality of the uh, European Parliament and glad that you have come uh, this morning. The aim of the project, uh, uh, in very short and simple terms, is twofold. Uh, it's to identify and understand uh, new and relevant, really <coughs> relevant threats, uh, to understand how they evolve and how they are embedded in society and our social relations. Secondly, it uh, aims to develop methods for researching these, for researching the, them and, and understanding future uh, threats. And finally, of course, it aims to make relevant recommendations not only to policymakers about security and how security should be managed, but about how security best should be researched. Now, what's unique about this project, and it goes into what we might call a, a new generation of security research uh, bubble in, in Europe, is that it forefronts the notion that security is a societal matter. That security is a, a primary concern of society. That's easy to grasp. But what's a little bit more innovative is that society is also a primary provider of security. So where in the past, traditionally, we've often understood, we've built institutions uh, like the military, like the police, like other forms of civil uh, security, in order to pre protect society, we've never until recently, or very little until recently, recognized the idea that society itself has a very important role uh, in this. And this relationship between society and security has been changing very, very rapidly. In the last in the last decade, uh, some might think it's fundamental, but it always it has not always uh, seemed that way uh, for most. And this is linked to um, the the breakneck uh, evolution in the concept of security, which uh, my colleague Tim Spice uh, is going to talk to us about in a few moments. The concept of security itself has changed very, very rapidly since the Truman Doctrine in 1945, which set up, which launched, if you like, the bipolar arms race, the, the notion that security was a national matter, and it was always somehow inscribed in a conflict east and west. That relationship of security and society gave way somewhere in the 1980s, uh, perhaps, somewhere revolving around the fall of the Berlin Wall to an idea that security is a global matter, and that there's a global society out there, and that non-East-West axis uh, participants are also implied in the security equation. 
that uh, development and security are closely linked. That, that economic development and cultural development are is linked. That climate change, the pandemic, that these non-military uh, <coughs> challenges also impact our understanding of how the relationship between society and security uh, should function. And then the third chapter, I don't need to tell you that the events of 11 September 2001 turned things on its head, not only in the most obvious ways, but also in the way we formulated, thanks to the inspiration of the uh, Bush administration, we formulated our greatest security challenge, again, as a war, a war on terror, an expression which is, hard, which is hardly used anymore, you might uh, notice. So terror and threats to, uh, to, the, to the West, to the United States, and to others were construed as global, coming from we don't know where, particularly, not respecting borders. And the only way to handle them, according to this discourse, was through a war. But society was not involved. It was really a, a, a military metaphor, and actually a military operation, which were used in order to engage in this, in this, uh, in this uh, uh, challenge. Now, on the European side, in 2004, the Madrid attacks and the London attacks, uh, remember, and, and not least the, the Oslo attacks just two years ago, have also forced a rethinking of this, I think in the hearts and minds of every man and woman on the street as well, not just in the policy net, among the policy makers, saying that, look, what went well in those attacks was the way society reacted. The resilience, the robustness of society was what brought our attention to them both in London, in Madrid, and in, in particular, I suppose, in Oslo. What was remarkable was that there was no war. There was no discourse of war. There was no bellicose reaction to it. It was really a way of setting a sort of European approach to the, the challenge of terrorism, asi aside from the American approach. And it's really become a viable alternative to look that way. That sort of societal meaning of threat and the response to threat through societal means is the inspiration to what I think we can call today in Europe the rise of <coughs> attention to the role that society plays in security matters. Both society understood as bottom level groups and assemblages and society understood as civil society in the, in the, in the more uh, traditional so it's not only hard security measures that protect us, uh, but also softer measures, which become both important for giving us security and have become important for, the, for being the objects of what we want to protect when we talk about protective security. So matters like so, so social cohesion, traditions, values, uh, resilience, culture. All of these things which fell completely in disrepute in the, in the eyes of the hard security communities during the Cold War, were not, even, were not even evoked, have become, they haven't taken over, let's not exaggerate, but they've become uh, visible and audible in, in our time. So as a consequence, this changes the way we think about security, obviously. But it's already changed the way the police work. <coughs> it's changed the civil military uh, relation. It's changed the way that the militaries work. NATO has recast its concept. Uh, the many national, uh, its concept of security. Many national militaries have recast their concept, concepts of security, uh, uh, both by necessity, because they see that the new challenges are actually related to society, but also on the public side, because there are expectations. Civil society, the public sphere, now accepts no less than uh, that the principles of open liberal societies also apply to security, to security measures, to security <laughs> risks. And uh, there's a higher degree of accountability, not least in Europe, as we stand here in the, in the uh, field office of the European Parliament. This is the place to underscore it. That the public sphere, the European public sphere and elsewhere, uh, is, is making greater demands to those who will provide us security, 
and those who want to generate research and new ideas about security. These demands, these expectations of the public sphere, then are what are in part inspiring the rise of societal security as the new dynamic in Europe. So this has made us in our project to, 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 complete, to conclude, go back to the fundamental questions about what society is, what does it mean that society is under threat? What is really a threat? What is the threatness of a threat? Well, our answer, our, our hypothesis in the project is it has something to do with people. It has something to do with what people value, what they hope for, what they fear, what they want to keep, what they're afraid to lose. Uh, our program today is, is, a, is a work of art, and it's thanks to the genius of Asaid McCarthy and her team. Uh, <laughs> It brings together both knowledge and experience from, uh, I was going to say both sides of the aisle, but there are at least three sides of the aisle, which is a bit of a problem in, in, in any theater. <clears throat> but it brings together knowledge and experience from various sectors involved directly in the project and linked to the project, and also from uh, outside the project. Uh, people were very glad to take the time to come and to participate. It's a bit of a whirlwind, our program, if you notice the time frames, and so we'll, we'll probably keep things moving quite quickly. Now, and I know that Sly McCarthy has given me the task of doing that, of cracking the whip, and I, I'll do that uh, the best I can. So thanks very much for the hospitality, both from the European Parliament and of the Center for Irish and European Security. And with that, I conclude it, and it's my pleasure then to give the floor to Dr. Mark McGuire, who is Head of Anthropology at the National University of Ireland.